Welcome to a special edition of Expressions Art and Culture Talks by the Qatar America Institute for Culture. My name is Fatma Dosari, the Executive Director here at CAKE. We're a Washington DC nonprofit organization that does art and culture exchanges between Qatar, the US, and the larger Arab and Islamic worlds. We're here very honored today to host a creative and an artist who is gonna talk about his influences and talk about his inspirations and creative journey and how he started. We're very honored to have master calligrapher Mohammed Zakaria who's gonna talk to us today about his creative journey as a calligrapher but also as a master who taught a lot of calligraphers today. I grew up around some artistic people. My father and other people were in that business and um, I tried my hand at painting and drawing and stuff like that and uh, I just didn't feel I had any 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 sense of uh, empathy with with painting I didn't I it didn't make any sense to me I couldn't say what I felt I needed to say and I I basically dropped it by the time I was like 19 and said let's move on to other things you know and so I, I was working in a machine shop where I was working uh, on micro machining projects for the aerospace industry and things like that and it was a um, uh, it was a whole different world for me because uh, these were very loud and 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 obstreperous sorts of people that I was working with and they were lots of fun. And work at that point was actually kind of fun. And I um, thought, well, you know, I should have another language. You know, having English is not enough, you know. And so and I'd gone to a bookstore and I saw some language books, you know, teach yourself this, teach yourself that. But I saw this one called Teach Yourself Arabic. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting. And I picked it up and I said, ooh, look at the way it's written. It's written with an interesting st alphabet. So I began to learn Arabic. I began to, to, you know, take pieces of paper and write out these words, learn the grammar and how to compose sentences and stuff like that, acquire a vocabulary and stuff like that. I took a trip to Morocco in uh, early part of 61, later, late part of 60, I think spent a month there and it was an interesting trip because I'd never been any place outside the USA except Mexico. I, I realized that, that there is a connection with Morocco and, and the Islamic religion and so I decided to look into that a little bit and uh, I pursued it and I felt an attraction for it and I, and I went to our little local mosque, which was actually not so local. It was about a three-hour bus trip from, from where I lived, and it took an all-day to get there and, and an all-day to get back, so it was a very little thing. But it was, um, uh, I just said, hey, let's, I, I felt I needed to take that step to cross over this line. Uh, if I stayed on this line, I would never understand it, but if I stepped over this line, then I would become more involved with it. And so uh, I did that, professed the, the faith, and I went into it and um, uh, never looked back. I began to go to mosques in Morocco. I got to know many things through uh, this very learned gentleman. And then I lived with a family in Fez, and, and there were people that I, uh, that a family that, for instance, had a, an ancestry that had come from Andalusia, and I began to be a aware and interested in the Andalusian history. And so uh, the whole thing became instructional in that sense. And I, and I was actually able to read books by this time, Arabic books, and I took some that were very instrumental in uh, learning what this whole thing was about. What is this Islamic religion about? How does it work? How does it, what, what, what is it like? What does it do? So you went from interest in the Arabic language yeah. to interest in Arabic culture and then yeah. to interest in Islamic faith. 
So, yeah, it all kind of came at the same time. Yeah. Because I, you know, I knew so many people, Moroccans actually mostly, because I was with an older generation of people there with most of my time. But they were scholarly people, and and uh, they they were very kind to me to show me how how things operated. You know, yeah. to help me to get through this initial stage, because most people who convert they have a hard time. Getting that kind of a of an of an of an education, you learn these things, and you, you, it's all by osmosis. Yeah. Nothing is formal. I didn't do anything formal. I never took a formal class in my life. I never went to anything that you could call a classroom, but I hung out and 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 became friends with scholarly people, uh, people from the Karawiyin and and Fez and and people from all sorts of different walks of life, booksellers, people like that. And one day. I was in a bookstore in, in, in Tangier, Tangier, and I heard a guy, I, I, had, I had gone to, to see the bookseller, who's a friend of mine named Nasrullah, and I said, Nasrullah, look, I see you have a Maghribi Quran, and I notice while I'm reading it that it's not exactly the same spelling as the one that, that I see in my uh, Eastern copy, you know, from, from uh, I had the Jerusalem copy at the time. It was actually, it was a Turkish copy, but uh, I, I said, what, what, why do you have a different spelling? I thought it was all to be the same spelling. And, and so he said, well, you know, I never thought of that. But let me find out. So he called the, on the phone, he called up the Karawi University in Fez, which is the oldest university, older than SR, still functioning. And, and, and he asked them, and, and they said something kind of enigmatic. They said, whoa, that's because that's the way it came to us, and mm -hmm. we just keep it that way. And what he didn't do was he didn't tell me the, the reasons why there are different things. And, they, and so they said, hmm, I have to study. And so I would track down anybody who knew anything or any kind of a book that I could find to find out how it works. And I saw, thus I learned about the different madhahib in Islam, and I learned about the, the different riwayats of the Quran and stuff like that. And uh, all these things, it became, it became completely clear to me why this is and why it worked, and, and it, it works very nice. We're very fortunate to have, as you said, all your pieces in one place, that uh -huh. this is a, a rarity. So we want to talk about this piece. Okay. Um, this is a um, Hedyai Sharif or Hidya Sa'adat. Hidya means the, the description of anybody. In this case, it's the description of Muhammad, mm -hmm. alayhi there, there are many, many versions of this text. Many of them are, have more detail than this one. This is the one that most people like. But frankly, there's some really wonderful stuff in this, in this one that gives you a, a sense that you have an understanding of who the gentleman, the prophet, actually was like and what sort of a person he was. And uh, people get a different idea that way. And I think it's a very important thing to have. I know that you had a good relationship with the Museum of Islamic Art in Qatar. And I'm really curious to hear more about your time in Qatar, what you've done there, hmm. what you've done, um, if yeah. possible, with Virginia Commonwealth University in Qatar, and all the educational aspect of calligraphy in Qatar. Well, Tell us about your time in Qatar. Yeah, I used to go there I went to the Qatar the first time. I, have a, I met a, an artist there named Yusuf Ahmed. He's a well-known Qatari artist. I found a very inventive artist. He, he, he did not go to the bookstore, the art store, and buy something, but he tried to make them. And he, and he ended up making paper out of, out of palm trees, Qatari palm trees. He began to make paint out of the dirt that Qatar is, is built from beautiful color, and they named actually, I think one of the paint companies named after this Qatari Brown or something like that. Mm -hmm. They named the color after it because of him. Anyway, he, he, was, he was an art aficionado, you would really mm -hmm. say, and, and, and so he would come over here a lot, or I would, I went to, to, to Qatar for the first time in 83, and we had an exhibition there, and I had a pretty good success in, the, in it, and I went and when I got home, I bought a new car, and that was nice. That was the most successful <laughs> ex exhibition I ever had. No, nope, never had that kind of look before, and or after. 
I went a couple of more times over there and met other people, and, and uh, like uh, uh, Sheikh Hassan Al Thani, a nice man, a good artist, and uh, an inventive thinker. And so we had Yusuf and, and Sheikh Hassan and other people like that, good conversations, discussions of the meanings of art, uh, technology of art, uh, the, you know, just wild discussions, very nice, yeah. very interesting. It's wonderful. So tell us about the, the British Museum and the manuscript. The British Museum, I went into it and, and I began to, to look at copies of, of old Masahif and, and old uh, books from various places from the Islamic literature and, 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 and the book culture. Mm -hmm. And um, in those days, you would go in and you would fill out a, a, a form says, I want this, I want this, I want this brought to my table. And then you would handle them with your bare hands, no gloves, and you could pick them up and smell them, hold them to the light, feel the texture of the paper. You have to develop a relationship with these things that causes you want to protect them and to, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So this is one of your students. Tell us about his work. Okay, this are three works by my student Josh Bearer. He has gone very far with it, but he comes at it with a different angle. He uses our technology, and yet he uses elements, in this case, for instance, Art Deco from the 20s and 30s of, of European and American art, and makes them transformed into items that work with this type of calligraphic treatment. I'm curious to talk about the future of calligraphy. Where do you think calligraphy mm. is going towards? And do you I, think I maybe, yeah. maybe hand calligraphy will become obsolete one day? Mm. Or would it be replaced by something more technological? That's really quite interesting. I believe that an artwork of the kind that I'm interested in making is not virtual, but, but actual real. You can pick it up and you can carry it around and you can tear it up if you want and stuff like that. So I think there's another school that's developing which is more computer aspected and is more virtual. And it's also, there's another school which is basically not text oriented, but more like uh, how things look. You know, it's, it's based on the combination of letters and things like that. And so these three trends, computer or calligraphy for the sh sake of its look, or the thing that I'm more interested in is text. What does it mean? There are things that people need to hear and see. I provide that to, through the art. And so we need to keep that alive. On the other hand, people will go ahead and use, um, let's say, a hurufi type of art, which is basically the shape of the letters and you can jumble them up and make interesting patterns, but they don't mean anything. And you will see that, and you'll see it in Qatar, and you'll see it very, there's a, several very famous people over there. And um, that's, that's an aspect. And then there are people who go all the way from all of that into generating their letters and then reproducing them to computers and stuff like that. And for us, what the human hand touches receives a connection, <laughs> this very deep connection, and it is transferred from the paper through the pen to the person and then back again in a loop, in a sense. And that gives the pieces some aspect of, of their quality. Mine you will look at my students and you'll see much better calligraphers than me. And that's not, that's not humble, I'm not a humble person. But it, it's true, they are, you'll see people who became, uh, or are becoming uh, the world's next calligraphers. And, and I don't think, a few of them do computer work, but most of these ones still use the, the old method, the, the uh, uh, stick of grass, you could call it, which is a column. But you, these, this tool has a feedback 
element to where you can feel the writing as you're doing it. And it goes into the pen and you can feel the thing. And then when you put it back into it, it goes back down and you see it in the writing. And you, you come up with something that's called in Turkish, it's called nefes gibi akashi. And that, that means the, the breath uh, like flow of the ink. And it means um, basically that it's the battle between art and nature. And when we produce a thing, of course it's art, but art means to do something where you do something that is new. You make something and it leaves a trace. And then if you have uh, art making that, what is nature? Nature grew automatically like a plant or a, or a flower or something like that. It's, or a stone even, it's all natural. It came to be through nature. And, and it has the natural inimitable beauty of creation in it. It is, it is the attempt of artists to, to make a thing that looks so natural in the way it's been produced that it seems like it may have just grown by its own self and its own nature. So that, that's, that's kind of one of the philosophy aspects of, of why we do the calligraphy on a one-to-one -one basis, because you can't do that in any other way. Yeah, what you described is very spiritual and very beautiful. And I think even when Islamic calligraphy started, a lot of like the early adopters and early writers and, and calligraphers were doing it for spiritual purposes and as part of worship. And mm -hmm. a lot of people nowadays want to differentiate between what is Islamic calligraphy, what is Arabic, you know, calligraphy. There's a difference. Is there a difference? Can you tell us a difference? There is a difference. Yes. Uh, the, the, the first time you see the term Arabic calligraphy is in really, really old books. But they're differentiating it says this is Italian calligraphy, let's say. This is Hebrew calligraphy. This is another calligraphy, and this is Arabic calligraphy. So they're connecting it to the sense of the language. And so that's how you would, that's the first use of it. Then it disappears. And people say, Fendul Khat. They say the art of calligraphy. They just say, Al Khat. They, they say, um, they, they never put an adjective to it. They just say, this is it. But somehow, in the growth of nationalism, people began to feel that they needed to have, to, to kind of appropriate this art, because it was mostly at that time uh, done by Turkish and Persian people. And they wanted to have something that was appropriated in, 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 into more of a, a, an Arabic milieu. And that's when the founding, the school, uh, Aziz Efendi from Turkey founded the, uh, the, the great academy of calligraphy in, in Egypt. And he, he taught and, and many of the great Egyptian calligraphers came from that. So, um, and, they, and that's about the time when you begin to see Arabic calligraphy be, beginning to use as two words that you can't separate them. Mm -hmm. Arabic calligraphy. Okay, so that's what it is. And people develop some sort of, I, I must say, little chauvinistic attitudes towards this. And, but, you know, we, 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 we just like to be, say, okay, do what you want. We'll do what we want, you know. Uh, I think, frankly, I prefer the term art of calligraphy. I translated the book under that title. And, and we all know what it means. We don't need to put anything in it. We don't want to exclude people because nowadays, look, there's, there's Arabic people, there's North African people, there's African people, there's Indonesian people, Persian people, uh, even some American people and European people, all coming into this art. And they all believe that there is a spiritual content to it, but that's really hard to, de to define. Mm -hmm. How do you define spiritual content? You can't. But you can promote it in a, in a certain way that allows it to flourish. And, and um, that's kind of where I'm at with it. But I think, I think we don't want to exclude anybody. 
We don't want to exclude people from even different religions who want to try their hand at it and work with it. Um, there are people, you know, who, who have a gift. And you wouldn't think so, but there are. Yeah. We should open ourselves to this. And, and, and we have, we have our, our heroes of this art, you know. We have heroes going back to Ibn al-Mukla and to Ibn al-Bawab. To me, Ibn al-Bawab is my basic hero. Died in 10, 12 or something like that, quite old. He's, he's the great founder of the whole art in itself, you know. Lived in Baghdad. Uh, Yakut Mustasimi, interesting one, very legendary. We, we can't sift out the, the truth from the falsehood about him, but we, he was very important. And then there was people that moved across that early zone, you know, early Anatolia, northern Iraq, and places like that where it really flourished. And then there was a whole other method being taught out in the west end of the Islamic world, in Andalusia and in North Africa and in West Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think these were creating a, a completely different approach. And so um, all of them have their treasures. Yeah. And we, we as people, especially as Muslim people, but as people, uh, we need to acknowledge the, the talents of these, of these people. Absolutely. And I think, I think that's where a museum comes in to give a, a forum for people like that to be seen and to become known. I'm nearly 80 years old. I've had a lifetime with it. And um, I have uh, had such, uh, such a gift from this art and the people who, who do it that, that um, can't even believe it sometimes. That's wonderful. With one of your favorite pieces, I want to end our interview today Thank you. Thank you. as yeah. part of Expressions Art and Culture mm -hmm. Talks. It was a great honor to talk mm -hmm. to you, Muhammad Zakaria, the mm -hmm. master calligrapher, mm -hmm. and learn about your penmanship and all mm -hmm. your students who we are having also as part of our exhibition mm -hmm. here at Cake. Mm -hmm. And I hope we get to celebrate the rest of your career and your students' mm -hmm. career in the future. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time. Thank you. I just wanted to introduce all these people to an American audience. You know? Wonderful. Yeah, and, yeah. and you're the means by which that happens, so that's nice. Thank you so much. Sure thing.